like to begin here this morning. How, how do you marinate yourself? I know that's a really weird thought. But what are the things that you do over and over? What are the things that no matter what season it is, what day it is, what day of the week it is, what week it is, this gets done. You do this thing. This is, this is something, hopefully for some of us at least it's like brushing our teeth. Is that, is that something we do often? Actually, don't raise your hand if, you're, uh, if that's no. But, but seriously, there, there are things that we do whether we realize it or not. It's just part of the rhythm of life. Some are unconscious, like breathing. We just keep breathing. We don't really think about it or choose it, but we just keep doing it. Are you with me on this? But what are some things that you do over and over? Because those are the things that shape you. Whether they're good things or bad things, whether they're neutral things, it doesn't really matter. It does matter, but it doesn't matter to the point I'm making. They, that, that's what you do with your life. That is your life. That's what you do is those things you do over and over. In 1993, I got to go to a concert, took the youth group with me to, in Nashville. It was in honor of a guy named Mark Hurd. I was very interested in him because he was the, one of very few people that Rich Mullins had ever covered one of his songs. And uh, he had covered his song, How to Grow Up Big and Strong. That's where the title of this message comes this whole series comes from. But his song, just in case anybody's looking at the playlist we posted and some other things, I want, I want you to know it's a sarcastic, intentionally caveman language kind of song poking fun at some alternate views of how to grow up big and strong, not God's. He was making a point that we need to choose God's way. And that's really the version that we're talking about. That's what we're trying to say. But in his, in his song, in the chorus, it says this, and the world keep on turning, and the sun keep on burning, and the children keep learning how to grow up big and strong. The things that keep happening over and over and over not only shape us, but the generations to come. And so it's important. And that's why we're walking through this this morning. What's always turning? What's always burning in your life? Moses had three big um, seasons in his life. He had three 40-year segments of his life where he kind of marinated in totally different ways of looking at life. The first 40, he spent in Egypt, kind of as Egyptian royalty. And he knew from birth, really, that he was supposed to somehow save Israel, be part of God's process in doing that. But he spent 40 years being educated and and living as an Egyptian royal. And so when he finally tried to take action, it was violent. He was asserting his authority. He was trying to get people to follow him because they were afraid of him. How many, how many know that story? Did it work very well? No, it didn't. But it, it came very naturally to him because he had marinated in that way of looking at life. Well, then he spent 40 years out in the wilderness. And he's basically just a shepherd and he's hiding. He doesn't want anybody from Egypt to know where he is. And so he got really good over 40 years at just surviving and saying no and keeping his head down. And so when God himself shows up in a burning bush and calls him to go to do what he knew he was supposed to do from birth, he says no. Straight to God. No, I can't do that. I can't do that. That's not in me. I can't do that. Why? I believe because he'd gotten really, really good at hiding. Really, really good at just going through the motions of taking care of sheep every day and that's all I'll ever be. Thankfully, he did listen to God. God tweaked his plan a little bit, had his brother team up with him and his sister team up with him and some great stuff happened there. And then he spent 40 more years becoming the leader that we know him to be from history. I hope that makes sense. But the stuff that we do over and over really shapes us. And it shapes the choices that we make. Even when we're trying to do the right thing. And even when we're talking to God himself. Marination is a really interesting thing. I just learned this recently. Any good marinade has three ingredients. It probably has lots of others. But the three ones that make it work are this. Acid, oil, and spice. The oil and the spice is what flavors it, but the acid has to break it down a little bit, break the meat down just a little bit. It kind of opens up on a micro level. It opens up space for the oil and the spice to get into. 
I think there's something powerful about that, the stuff that we do over and over. It kind of breaks us down and allows God to put something into us or allows somebody else to put something into us. Another interesting tidbit, this is just interesting trivia. I hope you like stuff like that because I'll throw it at you every once in a while. But marinating meat it makes it 95% more likely to not cause cancer when you eat it. I just thought that was cool. And I, I think marinating in God's word makes us a whole lot less likely to make the world a worse place and a whole lot more likely that we make it better. So that's why this first big idea, and if you're taking notes, if you've got one of these, the first big place where you can write down blanks is this. Marinate in God's word. You could just say, study the Bible. But how many have ever heard that that's important before? You know this, right? Uh, hope and pray. Literally hope and literally pray that you are hearing this with fresh eyes and fresh ears this morning because this is so crucial. It, to study God's word is so much more than just making some time to read a passage ever so often. It's so much bigger than just trying to uh, make sure that we have all the right doctrine in place and all that kind of stuff. To marinate in God's word is to actually be transformed by it. You spend enough time in it that it breaks you down and it flavors you with the stuff of Jesus. Transformation happens when we approach God's word expectantly and intentionally. We don't just spend time with God, we invest it. Let me say that one more time, and if you're filling out any more blanks, that word invest is in that. We don't just spend time with God, we invest time with God. There's a huge difference. Spend, you just waste. You, you just do it. Maybe it's not a waste. Maybe you're really glad you spent it. You're really glad and it's worth it to you whatever you just spent that money on, but it's gone. Invest, so there's gonna be something you expect on the other side. And this idea of intention, this idea of, of awe of God's word is throughout the word itself. I think one of the most dramatic places is Psalm 119. It's an entire like song that's written in worship of how much David loved God's word. In the middle of that, it says this. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is a dream. This is what happens as we internalize it. It becomes part of us. Uh, there was actually a guy that worked with Rich Mullins a lot. His name was David Strasser. It was years after Rich had passed and stuff that they actually said what his real name was. He was just always known as Beaker. And um, it's kind of referenced to they thought he looked like the Muppet Beaker or something like that. But he actually wrote a lot of some, a lot of Rich's really good music, or at least co-wrote it. For example, the song Step by Step, he actually wrote that chorus. Oh God, you are my God, I will ever praise you. Rich wrote the verses, and they wrote that song sometimes by step together. One of my favorites that they wrote together was a song called Boy Like Me, Man Like You. Anybody ever heard this one? It's a beautiful song. If you haven't ever heard it, you need to hear it. But it's kind of an imagination song. It's asking a lot of questions about what was it like for Jesus to grow up. And in the chorus, it asks this question. Um, said, um, did they tell you stories about the saints of old? Stories about their faith? They say stories like that make a boy grow bold. Stories like that make a man walk straight. That's a great question, great thing. Except we actually know the answer to that. Jesus absolutely studied God's word. And if anybody didn't need to, it's the one who helped inspire it, right? But we know for a fact that Jesus did. One of the things he said over and over in so many situations, whether he's fighting the devil in the wilderness or he's clearing out the temple or just teaching, he kept saying, it is written or as it is written, for it is written. He was constantly referring back to what we know as the Old Testament. And not only that, he knew exactly where to find stuff. Notice one of the first times he ever spoke publicly. It's in Luke 4. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom. Notice this is something that Jesus did over and over. He had a rhythm of weekly meeting with the people of God. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. 
Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Notice that he could instantly find that. Have you ever seen a scroll? It's hard enough to find with all the page numbers and all the verse numbers. Having to just boom, boom, boom. And in that little part that he's quoting from Isaiah actually comes from two different chapters. What we would call Isaiah 61 and Isaiah 58. He starts with 61 and then moves to 58. Possibly because you read Hebrew, what, we, what looks like backwards to us. You go the other way. But he knew exactly where to find those spots. Instantly. And I don't think it was just because he was Jesus. I don't think this was like a walk on the water kind of a miracle. I think he had studied God's word. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. Back then they would stand to read the scriptures and then they would all sit down, including the speaker, to talk. The eyes of everyone was in the synagogue, was fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, obviously, what Jesus is saying here is something very unique to him. He's saying, I am that person. This is happening. The Messiah that that passage promised has arrived, and you're seeing it. But this idea of Scripture being fulfilled is all throughout the Scripture. It's fulfilled when we live it, when we actually do what it says, when that marinating process actually affects the way that we think and the way we act in the world. Tragically, some of the best Bible studiers, as far as just knowing the facts, were the Pharisees. But they missed completely what it meant to fulfill God's word. In the 1800s, Soren Kierkegaard told a parable about ducks. You probably heard this, but I think it's fair repeating. And if not, uh, this this is a very short but simple story that resonates with me a lot. He said, once upon a time, there was a church made up of ducks. And every single Sunday, the preacher duck would preach to the ducks and say, you have wings. God created you with wings. And all of the ducks would say, amen. And they would cheer for the preacher duck. And then they would all waddle home. A few of you are still getting it, but the rest of you, that's hard, isn't it? When we study, it's got to be more than just filling in the blanks, just knowing the facts, just spending the time. It's got to be an investment. For God, what he's wanting is that we actually change. When we have that aha moment, when we go, wait, we have wings, we can fly, we actually try flying on the way home. That is the dream. And so when we say we need to study the Bible, it's not just some sort of a you really should work this into your schedule or somebody's going to judge you. You're not a good enough Christian if you don't read the Bible sometimes. It's got nothing to do with that. It's what you marinate in is what you end up being like. And if we marinate in the word of God, we become like Jesus. Paul wrote, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. In other words, those are all things that shape how we act. And righteousness is acting the way God created us to act, the ways that God loves for us to act. I think it's interesting to note, when Paul is writing this, uh, I'm not even sure he himself realized that what he was writing at that moment would one day be part of our scriptures. He's referring to their scriptures, the Old Testament. But he's telling them, hey, all these cool stories about Jesus that are getting passed around, all these letters I'm writing that are getting passed around, I hope you're reading those. But don't forget, all scripture is still useful for all these things. The whole Old Testament and everything still matters. It all matters. We need to know the whole thing. We need to know the whole thing. Not just that Jesus fulfills it. What does he fulfill? What does that mean? Why did he quote that? What what does that mean to me today? I think one of the most dangerous things we do is we get somebody else's idea and then we get one verse out of the Bible and we try to make that say what that person said 
It's called proof texting. Here's what Rich Mullins said about that. He said, proof texting is a very, very dangerous thing. I think if we were given the scriptures, it was not so that we could prove that we were right about everything. If we were given the scriptures, it was to humble us into realizing that God is right and the rest of us are just guessing. By the way, if anybody's tripped up by his word, if there, he liked to say stuff like that just to mess with people. He believed, and I do too, and I hope you do, that God did give us the scriptures. But notice what he said. It's not to prove that we're right about everything. It's to humble us into realizing that God is right. The rest of us are guessing. We've got to align ourselves with that. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Love the image that he's referring to in the Old Testament here. Most of you probably know this, but just in case, I think this is really important. Sometimes when Moses would go and talk to God for extended periods of time, the Bible doesn't explain why, but it says he would come back and he would be physically glowing, so bright that people couldn't look at him, and he'd have to put like a veil over his face just so people could be in his presence. There was something about spending time that closely, that intimately with God for such an extent been an extended period of time that it actually just physically changed him and made him almost incompatible with everybody else. But Paul is saying there's nothing between us and God here. Jesus has removed everything between us and him. And so we don't just get a little bit transformed. We get completely transformed. That leads us to the second huge idea, and that's this. We need to communicate with God himself. That's a fancy way of saying we need to pray. But that sounds boring, right? Because here's the only reason saying prayer sometimes bores us, is saying a prayer is not that exciting. If I were to talk to you this morning and I just rattled something off to you, that would not be a thing. If I just said, hey, good morning, Um, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. That's not a conversation. That would get really annoying really, really fast, right? But if we actually meet and the two of us just actually talk and I go, hey, seriously, how are you? And you give me a real answer and I go, wow. And then you ask me and we mean it. That's a totally different experience. And when we pray, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for an actual connection with God. We're looking that God is going to change us. That experience, that connection with him is going to make us different somehow. If you're filling in blanks, there's, there's that communicate with God himself. And then here's the next part. While he speaks to us in many ways, he never changes. We study and pray primarily to connect with him. I believe this so strongly. The longer I live, the longer I pray on a regular basis, the longer I pray in different ways, the more I realize that one of the biggest things that prayer does is to align me with him. It it shapes my heart. It changes me. It changes how I look at my circumstances more than it even changes the circumstances. And when I see God actually respond to my prayers and change the circumstances, I, I get even more excited than I ever did before because I'm little by little starting to get to know him a little better. And that's really what it's all about. A lot of you like to fish and hunt or do some other things that take extended amounts of time. And some of the appeals you get to be alone and some of the appeal is you get to be with other people. It's kind of awkward for a couple of guys or a couple of ladies to just, hey, let's just spend the entire day together. It's kind of awkward. But if you're hunting together, that's okay. You're fishing together. You're shopping together. You're painting together. Do you know what I'm saying? Suddenly you've got something to do, and it kind of breaks the ice, and everything is, it's a lot better. There's something to do there. There's a real connection. 
We all crave that kind of intimacy. And here, here's something I hear all the time. One of the biggest blessings in my life right now is I get to be part of Celebrate Recovery. It's kind of like Alcoholics Anonymous, but it's, it's a Christian faith-based thing. And um, there's a bunch of us from Morrison Hill that participate in that. But one of the things I hear them saying over and over is, is they say, in the big group, we feel better. In the small group, we get better. And there's something about getting in smaller groups that really does change us. If they're good groups, if they're focused. And that's why you'll notice today that there's a list in your bulletin. And if you're joining us online, there's a digital version of it. I'm, I, I guarantee you this probably isn't comprehensive, but we just wanted to get something on paper to show you. Here's some options if you don't know they are. But these are groups that exist right this minute in our church that are focused on either prayer or Bible study or both. And all of them have a vision for transformation. And I know there's more, and that doesn't even count all the Sunday school classes and a whole bunch of other groups that I know aren't on there. But these are specifically focused on some sort of a, a Bible study. It's called a Bible study or some sort of a prayer group. And all of these are designed to change us. But brothers and sisters, here, let, 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 I hope you hear me on this. If you really want to change, if you really want to become more like Jesus... This has to happen. The big group stuff has to happen. It needs to be part of the rhythm of your life. But so does some sort of a smaller group, some sort of an accountability group, somebody who's going to walk you through that stuff, somebody you can talk to and ask questions and answer their questions, somebody who's going to pray with you. And on top of that, if you really, really want to become like Jesus, which is always his dream, it's always our dream, You've got to have some time where you're alone with Jesus too. You've got to have some time that's part of the rhythm of your life that you are communicating with God himself, that you're marinating in his word. That's not a judgment. That's not condemnation. That's not trying to make anybody who doesn't do that for hours every day feel small. I'm just telling you the truth. It's like, hey, if you, if you want to... Be healthy, you need to eat these kind of things and a little less of these kind of things. It's not a judgment, it's just how it is, right? We all understand that. You should drink more water. It's just a truth. If you want to be like Jesus, you've got to marinate in Jesus. It's going to break you down. It's going to make all the stuff of Jesus soak in. James says this, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. We do, whether we're with Jesus or not. But the only way that we can keep changing to be like him is being around him. I love this quote from Brennan Manning, that is one of um, Rich Mullins' big mentors. He says, you will trust God to the degree that you know you are loved by him. In other words, you'll trust God. You'll actually believe in God enough that you'll actually do something about it the more you realize how much he actually loves you. And how do you get to know just how much he loves you? By marinating in his word. By spending time with him. And by trusting him just enough to actually do something about it each time. And little by little, that builds if you would, let's go back to that same passage from Psalm 119. But listen, these ideas of studying God's word and it being God's word and it actually connecting us with God, they're inseparable. I'm going to read the exact same passage, but listen to it. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. When it gets personal, it gets real. One of the amazing stories in the New Testament is where Jesus took some of his disciples up on a mountain, just three of them, and he was transfigured before them. Anybody remember this story? It's a crazy story. It's not that unusual that he'd go off alone. That's something he actually did all the time. It's not that unusual that he took a couple of people from the group with him. He did that all the time. It is unusual that they got to see him in his full-on glorified form. And they not only got to see him, they got to see Moses and Elijah. 
freaked them out. They didn't know how to react, just like none of us would. They, they were like just making goofy stuff up. They didn't know what to do. But something that I think is really interesting is that word that we translate, almost every English translation calls that transfiguration. It's the exact same word that's in Romans 12 and a bunch of other places that we always trans- translate as transform. Brothers and sisters, I urge you in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this dark world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will know what God's will is, his good, perfect, and pleasing will. Sound familiar? It's the same word. There's something about it at where we're changing completely, and there's something about it where he's restoring the image of God that's been in there all along. It's just gotten broken and twisted and messed up. One of the things I love about Rich Mullins is the way that he would uh, sign all of his autographs. He got pretty famous toward the end, and he'd always just write, Be gods, not small g, plural gods, capital G, O-D, apostrophe, yes. Belong to God. Be God's. And sign his name. That's all he had to say. It's no, no really profound thing or anything. But those of you who are trying these things right now, those of you who tried silence and solitude, those of you who are going to try to read the Bible more and pray more this week, I'd like to give you some really practical advice from Rich about that too. He says, when you feel that struggle, when you feel that emptiness, when it starts getting tense, when you have almost a panic feeling, I, 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 I don't like this, I don't like this silence, and everything else that you're not doing is just rising to a certain surface, that's normal, but here's what he says, don't try to fill it, don't try to fill that emptiness, that brokenness that comes up, don't try to quiet it, but ask God to give you the courage to face that and walk through that to him. Because when we connect with God, I don't believe that means that the emptiness goes away and is always gone. But it frees us from all those kinds of IV kinds of needles that keep us bound up in some kind of a hospital. You guys have all heard the term self-medication, right? That can be healthy. A lot of times it's not. But it traps us. What heals us is actually reconnecting with our creator. What heals us is somehow getting through all of the lies and all of the half-truths and getting back to the truth and marinating in that. Brendan Manning says, define yourself radically as one beloved by God. This is the true self. Every other identity is illusion. God's love for you and his choice of you constitute your worth. Accept that and let it become the most important thing in your life. Richard Foster says this, of all the spiritual disciplines, prayer is the most central because it ushers us into perpetual communion with the Father. And that leads us to where we're going to wrap up today. If you're filling in notes, you're going to write the word follow. We got to follow him. This is an image that we see in the Old Testament and the New Testament. We see it constantly that God leads his people. He directs us. He shapes us not only just by things we do in one place, but he takes us somewhere. He takes us to do things. He takes us on a journey that's in our heart where we were like this and we end up being like this. This morning, somebody gave me a wonderful gift from the chosen. It's, I love it. it's one of my favorite lines from that, but on the back it says, uh, get used to different. When you follow God, you're going to get used to different. But we follow him. And God has always invited us into an ongoing relationship. If you're filling out another blank, that's it. That's the last one you got to fill out for right now. But this is it. When we follow him, we're not only focusing on him, we're not only going where he's going, but he's actually helping us along the way. 
If you've ever taken somebody down a path they've never been on, or you've ever taken somebody on a boat ride, or a motorcycle ride, or a car ride, or, or, or a long walk anywhere, or a trip through the mall they've never been to, or anything at all, you've ever walked somebody through that, there's a couple things happening. One is you're actually physically taking there, and the other is you're building a relationship. They're having to trust you every step they take. And that's what this idea of following God is all about. It's not only following him, but it's also getting to know him. And the same God that we see in the Bible stories, the same God who interacted in all these amazingly different ways with each one of the people in the Bible is the same God that interacts with us. And sometimes it looks really different. But one more lyric from Rich Mullins. We're actually going to sing this in a second, I believe. Sometimes I think of Abraham, how one star he saw had been lit for me. He was a stranger in this land, and I am that no less than he. And on this road to righteousness, sometimes the climb can be so steep, I may falter in my steps, but never beyond your reach. And this was before there was a written word of God. They could already commune with God. They could already marinate in God's word, the things he told them. It was shaping everything, even what they saw when they looked up at night. Just a couple last quotes and a big challenge come and brace yourselves. Here we go. Richard Foster says, a farmer is helpless to grow grain. All he can do is provide the right conditions for the growing of grain. He cultivates the ground, he plants the seed, he waters the plants, and then the natural forces of the earth take over and up comes the grain. Hopefully this is familiar to you if you were here last week or joined us online last week. This is the way it is with the spiritual disciplines. They are a way of sowing to the spirit. By themselves, the spiritual disciplines can do nothing. They can only get us to the place where something can be done. We don't practice silence and solitude and studying the Bible and prayer just to check it off of a list. We do it to follow God. We do it to be transformed, to be covered in the dust of our rabbi, to, do, to, to constantly be changed to be like him. And don't miss it. This is exactly what Jesus had in mind. He he said things like this all the time. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. The people who really get to know God are the people who are willing to marinate intentionally in his word and in time with him to follow him daily, whether they feel like it or not. Those are the people that actually are transformed and that actually reach the destination God has for each one of them. So we marinate in God's word. It's easier than it's ever been, guys. I'm telling you right now, I am so thankful for all the apps and all the different kinds of websites and all the different kinds of printed Bibles there are these days. It's easier than ever before. If you don't like to read, you can listen to God's word in any language, any version you prefer. If you want to study the original languages, you don't have to go to school and learn them. It'll walk you through it right there. There's websites for Greek and Hebrew. You can walk right through any of it. Go down all the commentaries. If you really want to study God's word, you can. You just have to create some space where that's going to happen. If you really want to communicate with God, all you have to say is, our Father in heaven. You can do it. Because of Jesus, so much happened. This wouldn't be possible without him and his sacrifice. But he did do that sacrifice. It's one of the things we celebrate every single time. How dare we not take advantage of it? How dare we not use the freedom and the ability to connect with God that he's made possible? We can follow him here and now when we're in groups like this and every single day. That's always his dream. Yesterday, I had the privilege of uh, speaking very briefly at a memorial service for Janice Brickey. I don't know if you guys all knew her or not. She was an amazing woman, Uh, lived uh, the last 45 years of her life in a wheelchair. 
And uh, just never let that slow her down at all. And uh, they told a story uh, that I hadn't heard before, but I'd just like to end with this. It was so inspiring to me. But uh, one of the things she did all the time was go to prisons to, to, visit, to lead worship and just visit and encourage them. And one of the times that she went, uh, she wheeled herself in and uh, she was all, she wheeled herself in and she met somebody she'd never met before. And she goes, how are you? And he said, well, I'm, I'm okay under the circumstances. It was a pretty funny thing to say in prison, right? But she instantly didn't know this guy, but she, she went like this. We are not under the circumstances. You are not defined or controlled by the circumstances of your life. You have to face them, but we are under the authority and the power of God. That's what defines you. What, all your circumstances are just the obstacles you have to face today. That's not who you are. That doesn't have any power over God. Can you believe that? She's saying this from a wheelchair. And she lived it. And that's my mission. You, you, you may be sitting here going, I, don't, I, don't, I can't find any more time to read the Bible or pray or get alone or any of that. What are you talking about? My life is already full. Guess what? Somehow or another... Could you do that with me real quick? And if anybody says this week, hey, you know what? I just don't have time. I just can't do it. Or this morning, if God is telling you, you need to make a public decision somehow. Or even just a very private one. I'm telling you right now. You're not under your circumstances. Jesus set you free. Do what you need to do this morning.